David, take us behind the scenes on how often people power struggle in organizations as the reports now come out. And it's the first time we're hearing these reports that Brian Flores wanted more power from Chris Greer, the general manager, even though uh, Brian Flores already ran the building. It happens in just about every organization. What you do as president of a team is you have to look at the power dynamics between your GM and your manager or your GM and your coach because it is the very rare occurrence where they can coexist. In the olden days, in the days of yore, it was more common that people could get along. But now, especially in the NFL, you've got coaches and GMs who are at loggerheads very often. And that's why you had a period of time where there were some coaches who were also GMs, which you could never have in baseball. And therefore, my job was to make sure the manager and the GM had some sort of peaceful existence and that got harder and harder to do as the front office tried to control the manager more and more. And sometimes managers don't want to give up any control over lineup, over players, over the game plan, over schemes, over any of it. And as an owner or president, you're weighing every day who's got the power, what they're doing with the power, and then sometimes you have to choose a side. The best thing is when your team is winning, you can live with people who don't get along. There were many times that our GMs did not get along with our managers, and that was fine with me as long as the team was performing, as long as they were civil. But there are examples that happened with the St. Louis Cardinals when they fired their manager and everyone was shocked, and it was simple. They called it a difference of opinion or a difference of theories. Really, it's that there are personality conflicts and differences in power. And it's one of the toughest decisions to make for an owner or president is to which side to go with. But one more thing, Dan, what about the tons of employees underneath the coach and underneath the GM? Those in the analytics department, in the development department, in the scouting department, when there's an internal power struggle, each employee, each under employee chooses a side and they choose the side that they think is gonna win the power struggle. So everyone in the Dolphins organization who chose Brian over Chris, they're looking over their shoulders this morning because they chose wrong. You said especially in football, is it because, and I thought of this when Mark Kotze was hired by Oakland, because the switch has already been made in baseball. Nope, the general managers are in charge, and they will put a manager in charge who's going to do exactly what they say, and he's there to basically, in Kotze's case, be a former player who's respected by other players, but he's going to take his orders from on top. That's what I assume. Now, one of the great power struggles in football is really over player personnel, much more so than in baseball. There's many more managers who say, just give me 25 guys, but then let me decide who to play, when to play, and how to play them. You rarely have managers who walk into the draft room, as an example, if ever, and say, oh, I like this guy. I went to see him, and he should be our first-round pick because managers don't have time to go on the road and scout high schoolers or, or college players. But in the NFL, you've got coaches who are much more invested in the draft because they are helping the team immediately in the next season. In baseball with the draft, it's likely the manager won't even be around by the time the drafted players play. But in football, they're meant to help the coach the very next season. And that is one of the reasons why the NFL has so many more of these power struggles and so many more times where you do have the coach who actually has more power than the GM. I know we've covered some of this ground with you because we've talked to you about firings, but off the top of your head, just rat-a-tat-tat, when you think of worst firing situations, most uncomfortable, what are, you, what are your thoughts? What are the first few things you're thinking of? There's no such thing. I think that's a construct of the media and the construct of the fans. That's not how we feel in front offices. Nothing's awkward, even when we bungle it, even when rumors get out that we're interviewing the next guy while we still have the former guy. I was thinking back to the Steve Ross. He had Tony, what was his name, Sapor Soprano? Sperano. Sperano. All right, Pete. He, he was the coach, right, when Steve Ross was going to try to hire Harbaugh. I may have missed yes, the story. Yes, yes. That's not uncomfortable either to Tony or to Jim or to Steven. That's just sort of the M.O. that happens because you have to have a plan in place. That's why it's so funny to me that Steve Ross – it's not the case that he just woke up and said, oh, I, I think we have to go a different direction. We're going to get rid of Brian and keep Chris. Of course he has a plan. And all of these, I'm asking permission for this guy and that guy. We're going to search for somebody 
It's 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 all a bunch of horse hockey. Stephen Ross knows exactly who he wants as his next head coach. David, did you have like a personal toughest fire guy, a person you had to fire within the Marlins organization that it was very difficult for you to do? It's an easy one, Stu. Larry Beinfest. Ooh. Larry Beinfest had won a World Series with us. I was very close to him on and off the field. And after we had our, the issues that we had in 2012, uh, Jeffrey wanted to move on from him. And I, I fought for Larry because I didn't think that Larry was to blame because many of the moves that we were unhappy about were moves that Jeffrey wanted to make that he insisted that we made. But we needed a fall guy because it wasn't going to be me. So as much as I love Larry, I wasn't going to let Jeffrey fire me instead of Larry, but I was not happy with that firing. Would you say that to Jeffrey flatly in the defense of Beinfest? Hey, the bad moves around here are yours, not his. It's funny. It depends. That's a great question. Uh, I would choose my spots because when you're dealing with an owner, you can't blame everything bad on the owner, even when the owner's responsible for everything bad because they all have egos. So I didn't blame everything, but the specific one that I blamed was Heath Bell. But then he said to me, it wasn't me who did Heath Bell. We had one of Larry's guys say that Heath Bell's a good guy, and look at him, he's a total POS. So that one wasn't my fault. And I said, well, what about John Buck? And he would say, everybody wanted John Buck. I only gave him the extra year, so don't blame me for that. Blame me for the extra year, but it's my money. And I, and I, so he would have answers to many of the problems. Ozzie Guillen was a great one to blame because none of us wanted him and he did. But on the other hand, I was not standing on the edge and saying either him or me. And I did that a few times with Jeffrey over the years, but not with Ozzie Guillen. And I'm just thinking about 2012 as, as an example that still is in people's minds, even though we got the better end of that baseball deal, might I add. But it does happen where you have to just do OP, which is owner's prerogative. But did he ever come to you and say, hey, David, that one's on me. That player, that or, that's or, on me. Or accountable instead of trying to defend, because what you just sounded, it sounded defensive. It's always someone else's fault. How often would you go to him and be like, no, this is something that you blew, and his answer is like, yeah, you got me there. I can't think of one. And the reason I can't think of one is the owner's in, and he's not alone. I can't think of an owner who stands up to his president or GM and says, yeah, that was an owner's prerogative and I totally got that wrong. Because owners are owners and they get to be who they are because they don't feel as though they ever make any mistakes. You're in such an unusual position when it comes to your relationship with him and understanding the business of sports and the thing that you're saying, owner's prerogative. Were you then a diluted version of yourself with him? Uh, were you not necessarily a yes man, but not someone who's as candid in front of a microphone now talking about it? Would you be that honest in front of him saying something was flatly your fault? It depended where I was with my contract, and it depended on what was going on. Remember, uh, my relationship with him changed when he and my mother got divorced back in 2004. So I spent 13 years with him when we negotiated contracts through lawyers. And there were plenty of times when uh, he was angry enough with me that, that he wanted to let me go because of what was going on off the field or on the field. Plenty of times during the stadium negotiations. But at the end of the day, the reason I was able to keep my job is I kept proving to him that the value of the organization was going to keep going up and he was going to get to make a fortune as long as we just got a new ballpark. So let me get the ballpark. And to his credit, he stayed out of my way when it came to negotiating the ballpark, the design he was very much involved in, but the business side of that deal, he let me do, and that really was helpful. Look, we covered this yesterday, but we have gotten 10 minutes into this David Samson show and haven't covered the South Florida sports story of the year, and that's Kodak Black getting <laughs> grinded on inside of a luxury box at the Florida Panther game as other horrified luxury boxes looked on at first appearances. Horrified? Well, I mean, there was a lot of uh, Roy. You wanna? You were there. I was there. He was actually below me, uh, and I was in the press box. He was right next door to Roberto Lorongo and Bill Zito, yeah. to the ban the Panthers brass. Yeah, the front office. A lot of pearl clutching. I also liked. Yeah. <laughs> 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 right. Well, to, to be fair, you just did something. I don't know if the audience picked up on it. I think you did it. I'm not totally sure, but I'm gonna accuse you of it anyway. 
you threw to Roy there, and because you didn't want to be going to Roy necessarily on a Kodak Black opinion, you said, well, you were there. You were right under it. You made sure that you weren't we throwing. boots on the ground. I'm just the heady play. Uh, the bonafides. Uh, our network is expansive, and uh, we're covering all the big stories. So, Are you look. sure the front office was uncomfortable, or were they interested? This is South Florida, man. You never know when Bang Bus is going to roll by. Like you say, horrified, Mike. I'm not sure that titillate. May, it is Broward, though. If it in Miami, it wouldn't have been horrified. It would have been titillated. Just reading the faces covered in masks, I, I didn't think that they were, like, super comfortable with the situation going down. I don't know how many Panther games you've been to, but that's not typically something that you see at Florida Panther <laughs> games. But they could have ended it in 10 seconds. If they were so horrified, all you do is get up, you tell your security to go in there and have those people removed. Well, remember, remember, about a decade ago, we had a woman next to uh, rinkside putting her breasts on a glass. So we're, we were in a tizzy about that one, but uh, this – Kind of goes. I remember that tizzy. I remember yeah. that tizzy. But uh, this is stuff that goes down maybe in the 300 levels of uh, heat games or Miami Hurricanes. No, 305, games, not 95, not 954, yeah. not 954. Well, certainly not at not Florida sunrise. Panther games. It's a, Sunrise is a different deal. So th they obviously bring him in. He gets those heat comped, right? That's how this arrangement goes. And did the Panthers end up getting what they wanted and more? from Kodak Black, is this a good thing? No, it's it's a funny little piece of side news. Any press is good press if you're the NHL or if you're the Panthers, I get it, because they just want to be more than a hash line when it comes to South Florida sports, and it got some national attention. But the reality is I would be upset as president because the Panthers are so good, I want the attention on our team because we're performing in a way that we have an expectation that we can compete for the Stanley Cup and it's not embarrassing. I mean, now that I hear they're grinding, I thought they were actually having sex. Well, there are certain angles that make it difficult to discern. Well, you could see in the original <laughs> angle that went viral, there was uh, a gentleman that was recording the entire thing since all this happened. That angle has come out. And while people appear fully clothed, I'm actually a little bit more unsure of what happened with the second angle, given the pace and the, the motion in the ocean. And All of the sex that I've seen at ballparks has always been between people who are fully clothed. So it, why is that dispositive to you? This is technically the most national news that the Panthers have gotten, considering that they haven't been on national TV. I don't. I don't there see was how that Quenville thing. Uh, oh well, yeah, that was that, that terrible Quenville yeah, yeah. thing. I don't see Since, how this is actually bad david if you invite someone a celebrity to your game and you give them free seats you just got what you wanted from that transaction i didn't argue that i'm just saying i would have preferred if it had been actual sex now that i'm hearing it's grinding i'm just not sure it's as important what do you mean all the sex you've seen at stadiums how much sex have you witnessed at sporting events uh in 18 years three times that i saw now, how many times did it happen that I didn't see? I mean, I only have one pair <laughs> okay, of Okay, David, thank you. We're, we're well aware that you don't know what you didn't see in terms of sex being had at all, what did you see? all ballparks you were in. And were they celebrities? Uh, not to me. So, Oh, wait, that, that's important, though. Not to not him. To him. Uh, let's get David Sampson's top three times he's seen sex. Yes, in uh, yes. Let one include Jack there, McKee. And there I was, uh, <laughs> the, I don't know, Toronto probably still doesn't do this, but they used to have hotel rooms in the ballpark beyond right field. And so that would happen all the time there, right, where – where people who wanted to be seen by a stadium full of people uh, having sex would just have sex in right field. I think that we have to clarify the list because there may be a misunderstanding. I'm talking about sex between fans at a game who are not at a hotel where you can see the game, who are not in a clubhouse, who are not in a hotel room on the road. I'm talking about non-team affiliated people that I saw over the years having sex during a game. All right, That's you could you could give us the top we'll 3 about. experiences then. David Sampson It's all upper deck. The uh we need to go ahead and put on the program Bullshit. You close the upper deck for years on end. Hold on. I didn't say Marlins Park. This was all in the fish I said tank in my 18 years. We have to Once put at Olympic Stadium twice a pro player. 
But the upper deck is where you would go if you wanted some privacy, right? But it was I, not where you would go if you could watch baseball in Miami also, because it was closed off. Uh, you're saying if you want privacy, a stadium, uh, a stadium. <laughs> I, I, I understand it's not that, a Dan. Private I know. Place. Well, but within the stadium, well, I'm just saying. While David was running things, Marlin Stadium, uh, well, Joe Robbie Stadium, formerly known as, was probably as much privacy as you could get. Uh, there's no question that what Olympic Stadium and Pro Player had in common is that you could go to the top of the upper deck and be alone. And we would have security on the bottom. If you picture the way upper decks are, you go through a vomitory and then you walk upstairs to get to the top. So we would position people at the bottom of the stairs. Why make them schlep up a flight of stairs for no fans, right? Or when there's two fans. So what fans do is you go to the top. And it was always three times same position, might I add. It was the lap position facing forward looking totally innocuous, except what they were not aware of is the non-amazing technology of cameras that are looking all over for the purpose of trying to make sure that we don't have to pay people who get hit by foul balls who are otherwise distracted. So we're looking at the stadium with security cameras and you can see what they are doing. And they're, they're, they're clothed in a way, it's, it wasn't, the difference with Kodak Black is that position is such that that would be very impossible in a upper deck situation because the angle is such and the seats are, are angled, it has to be lap. And that's what I saw all three times. Once in Olympic Stadium, twice in pro player, never had an issue with it, never stopped it because it was not interrupting the game. It was not seen by anyone because they were alone. And it was done in a very discreet way. Have you, David Sampson, ever had sex in a stadium? Jessica doesn't yes. like the question. Oh, whoa, wow. We like the answer. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Jessica is Maybe. now hiding. You're right. I'm the only guy who's ever had sex in, a, in his working place. You're right. The only one. Never happened before. Jessica, what happened? You, you think you're just uh, a Marvel- I mean, Stu Gatz, you just uh, like what? yesterday or whatever day I was off with you and your Mexico trip and everything. Like, yeah. you just take everything so far. Mm-hmm. He's well, not he's I mean, not subtle, Jessica. What in Rome? I mean, he doesn't know how to do subtlety. It's one of the reasons the audience loves him, because that sledgehammer will fly out of nowhere. But now now it, 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 this is the problem with the interview. Now he's doing jazz hands. I got the answer. It requires some elaboration. You can't just say just that. I mean, or in the sledgehammer comment in the, this context, Dan is also uncomfortable coming from you. <laughs> it's a very invasive question. You shouldn't have asked. <laughs> it's been asked. Then once it's been answered, you can't just say yes and then right, leave it. Un- you- Ask the question again. We'll start again. What was the question? We don't have to start again. We can keep it moving. <laughs> Sugatz's lack of subtlety is charming and awkward, and us making it making fun of it is one of the devices. How many times? Oh dear God. Huh? Well, right. now it's a badgering. Now it's not even. Now it's right. an aggressive. Yeah, it's first follow-up. He's ever had. The first time Stugatz has ever had a follow-up that was, huh? <laughs> like, like, We're waiting. Like someone in the middle of a fight. Still, you must be. You're you're good. That was Dan rather like follow-up. Huh? That was really outstanding. <laughs> huh? <laughs> this is really Frost Nixon right now. Are there going to be any him more answers? Subtly. Ask him more subtly, like over, under, one and a half. Well, you just did. Yeah, I don't feel the need to continue this, especially when Jessica said she's uncomfortable with the entire conversation. Yeah. I was, I, I, you asked a question, I answered it, mm-hmm. and all I did in response was say that you are living in a dream world, Dan, if you think that this doesn't happen in the real world, because it does. There's law firms, there's investment banks. There are many, many places where things are happening because people work long hours and people are married, and that's how it goes. Take us through the Brian Flores leaking after the Brian Flores story. Take me through some of the reporting here where next thing next thing you know, all of a sudden I'm reading more bad things about Brian Flores than I ever heard the three years that he actually had power to uh, you know, be mean to people. So let me go through how that works. When you do a firing, 
you then have a group of PR people. Sometimes it goes to the top, your head of communications, but oftentimes you give it to a bunch of interns and you're asking them to monitor what is the reaction to the firing. Often you do a trial balloon before you do something, but this Brian Flores came out of nowhere, so they're monitoring it. And what Steve Ross was told by his people is that you are getting crushed. When someone is getting crushed for a move they've made, they then go into damage control. There's two ways to do damage control. You can move on quickly and name your next coach and have it be a victory. To, to look at what Miami did, and I don't want to get Mike Ryan all upset, but look what they did moving on from Manny Diaz and moving right into Cristobal. They got to change the narrative about how they treated Manny, and there could have been a groundswell of upset about it, but it got overtaken by the excitement of the new coach. Long, the king is dead, long live the king, that's the end of it. But in football, you can't name a coach that quickly because of the Rooney rule. Therefore, he's got to do these interviews. He's got to ask permission to speak to people and go through a process because he doesn't want to get fined or lose picks. Therefore, when you are on the wrong end of a PR situation with the fired coach, you've got to get word out, I did not fire the greatest coach in the world. Here's the 10 things he did, whether they're true or not, that made his firing for those on the inside not just palatable, but expected and not surprising. And that's the type of leaks you're seeing right now. I, I don't think the Miami Hurricanes would have skated if Mario Cristobal wasn't himself a minority candidate. I think the Miami Dolphins could have moved on from Brian Flores quickly if the person they were targeting was also a minority candidate. And then you don't have to necessarily worry about the Rooney rule. College football doesn't have such a rule, but all these big-time programs, if they have an open position, do interview minority candidates. And Miami would have been called to task for it. They just so happen to go from one minority to another. So you're saying that, that he should have just hired another minority and then not have to no. leak anything about Brian? No, no, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you use the Miami Hurricanes as an example, and they are the only football program in the history of the sport <laughs> to go from a Cuban <laughs> head coach to another Cuban head coach. They actually hired a minority candidate who was their only choice, so that's why they didn't get called to task for it. I, I don't think that the Dolphins are being called to task because Brian Flores is, is – African American. No, they're well. No, we can have that discussion too. But to the the concerns that you were outlining right there, that they have to worry about the Rooney Rule. They had to get in front of the hardball narrative. That was a problem. That wasn't Miami Hurricanes' problems, right? Because they went from another minority candidate. You just cited them as an example. I'm trying to explain why you can throw that case study out. Any, anywhere in the world, you say you go into stadiums, you don't know where people aren't having sex. Anywhere in the world that people are disparaging the University of Miami in any way, Mike pops up and defends them with defensive <laughs> homerism on any subject, nowhere. Any, any platform, <laughs> anywhere in this on this planet or beyond. Provide helpful context. It didn't even occur to me that it happened to be a Cuban to a Cuban. That's not even what I was talking about, nor am I talking about the fact that Brian Flores, he's a head coach. He's a good head coach who's going to get another job. It had nothing to do with his color. And the reason why Steve Ross had to, from the top, agree to disparage him the way he is was only to make himself look better because he has gotten bad press upon bad press, and he's now in laureate territory. I mean, just think about it. He's worried about being one of the worst owners in history of a South Florida sports team. And frankly, I think he's surpassed Jeffrey, and I'm not biased because until he wins the Super Bowl, uh, he's got to be in the lower position. That's weird because he's actually been a tremendous owner outside of the main thing that he purchased, which, which was the Miami Dolphins. The upgrades to that stadium are unique. There is not a single athletic complex on the planet that hosts as many world-class, uh, across a very wide spectrum, world-class events, potentially World Cup soccer. You got the F1 race coming down here. What he's done to that classy, stadium. Classy everywhere but the, field, but the field where incompetence undermines what otherwise is. His money has been spent elegantly everywhere else, David. The way this man, I mean, he had some issues as many owners did with some of the politics of protecting their taxes and not caring about anything else when it came to election time and where they supported. But he publicly at least he has leaned on being on the right side of some of these things, and he tries to look good, tries to look classy, and the Dolphins undermine him at every turn, and his management of the Dolphins undermine him at every turn. 
what is it that you want from your owner? Because now I'm very confused. Do you want the stadium upgrades and the F1 and the tennis, a new ballpark, or do you want winning? Winning. Yeah, most sports fans want winning. Uh, winning. That's I think Miami had a unique situation because they weren't going to host any more Super Bowls. They they desperately needed upgrades to that stadium if they weren't going to move. That's a great question that Samson is asking that once upon a time we could have done for four hours across uh, uh, local radio. We would have banged this topic. Worse owner, Stephen Ross or Jeffrey Loria? <laughs> because I did not think we could get this quickly, David, to someone worse in this town than Jeffrey Loria. No, but David's right. Like, he won a World Series. Stephen Ross is not. So it's definitely Stephen Ross, I think. He hasn't even won a playoff game, Steve. Right. How about just winning one playoff game? And it's not like this is his first year. I think he's been there over a decade. It My son was born in South Florida in 03, he, right before the World Series. He then is now a freshman in college. I think he's a 15-year owner, is he not? He's owned the team for 15 years, right? And and it's no no playoff victories. You're talking about Daniel Snyder's record isn't that bad. If you're just going to do it on field, if, if what you're going to do is results on field, the Lions have had a worse. Who else? The Browns have now been to a playoff the game. The Browns won a playoff the game. The Jets? So, yeah. Jets went to back to back AFC championship Conference games. Championships. The yeah. Jets. If the yeah, measurement the is Jets just is, if the successful. If the measurement of an owner, we do this with quarterbacks all the time, wins and losses. Can it climb all the way up to owner where you're going to do wins and losses and then say, well, Stephen Ross's uh tenure has been one of the biggest failures in the history of South Florida sports because they don't do they don't do anything. Which is crazy when you when you just consider the stark difference on the stadium, the real estate venture, the improvements, the amount of world-class events. But he here. also gave up all the collateral, Samson. He gave up all the Shula Marino collateral. He gave it to the Heat. The Heat came and took it, or he lost this city to the Miami Heat and used up everything Marino and Shula built. Do you think that Steve Ross did the things he did around pro player out of the goodness of his heart and love of the people of Miami? I mean, are you serious? No, about no, no, that? no, no. It's look, he's but he, Mike he likes made his money. Like he, the stadium is nice. No, he made his money in real estate. Right. This is obviously a, a means to an end. But it, it, in a you, look, I don't need to tell you the Marlins deal poisoned the well, and he absolutely used all your negative PR and spun it into a massive win when it was positioned as if he was pouring his own money and there wouldn't be taxpayer money going into these upgrades. I know you can poke holes into that, and by all means, go ahead. It's not that I'm poking holes. It's just not accurate. So Steve Ross did not use all of his own money for the upgrades. There is an actual fund that the NFL has where teams borrow money from that fund, which is money borrowed from a bank that gets distributed to teams in order to help build new facilities or retrofit and redo older facilities. In terms of all of the other things he's done around the area, Remember, Wayne Huizenga wanted to build an amusement park in that area. There's so much space there that you've got to do something. And he put a tennis center and took it away from Key Biscayne. I'm all in for what he's done. I would have done the same exact thing as president and owner of the Dolphins. But I'm specifically talking about what we got criticized for the most, which is results on the field. How about this quote from Stephen Ross in 2015? The, the Heat is a different organization now. The Dolphins are capturing the imagination of the whole South Florida fan base. <laughs> Good God, did that piss the Heat off. The Heat have sat out criticizing the Dolphins at every turn when the Dolphins have deserved criticism, and as soon as LeBron leaves town, the owner. that David, you can speak to this. The relationships between owners and rich people treating cities as their playpen and who liked whom and who respected whom within a city. How was Loria's relationship with the other owners? Non-existent. So we would all pretend this is one of the great things that you do in a city that has multiple sports teams is you pretend to root for the other team. But there is such <laughs> shot and fraud that goes on that any time there was an issue with another team, we would then swipe in and try to get their corporate sponsors, try to get their season ticket holders, try to do anything to poach because you're dealing with the same disposable income of your fans in Miami. And th th if they're not going to spend money on the Dolphins because they stink, great, come to the Marlins. Same with the Heat. That's why it was always so frustrating how good the Heat were for so many of the years I was there because they would keep the attention of South Florida all the way through June. 
And by then, oftentimes the Marlins were out of it or the excitement of the season would be gone. And so there was tremendous jealousy that, that goes on between owners and between presidents. Now we meet and we talk and we text on the side uh, on the presidential level, but on the ownership level, there is not a lot of love at all. You think that's every city? Or is that in any way unique to our city? No, it's every city. Yeah, it's not unique to Miami at all. How is Brian Flores supposed to feel? You mentioned earlier the professionalism of people understand when they're getting fired. But yet when Brian Flores is yanking around Tua, because I guess he's a kid, because he's somehow younger and hasn't lived, right? Brian Flores was dangling Deshaun Watson, or, or the Dolphin organization dangled the idea of Deshaun over Tua. Why would Brian Flores not be upset about this, but Tua would be. The idea of someone hanging over you or, or an, an, an opening coming free and someone else being available to uh, make it softer and more professional instead of personal. Managers are always going to take the position of the players they have in their clubhouse. They're always going to tell the players, hey, I I'd rather have you than the rumor of the trade that's going to happen or of the signing that's going to happen because they're with those guys every single day working with them. But then managers go upstairs and they say, hey, if you have a chance to get this bat or that glove or this quarterback, please, let's do it. I want the best players possible. But publicly, you're never going to say that. So Flores was between a rock and a hard place uh, from the media standpoint. But in his own mind, it was very simple. You back up your quarterback. And don't look for Brian to respond to any of the stuff that the Dolphins are doing. If he's got good advisors, they are telling him to take the high road because what the Dolphins are doing is just going to continue to bury Steve Ross, make him and the Dolphins look bad. You are going to get interviews. You are going to get another job. Do not get sucked into a back-and-forth PR battle with the Dolphins. Make sure to follow David on Twitter at David P. Samson. Check out his podcast, Nothing Personal, with David Samson. We'll get into your weekly review in a little bit, but a friend of our show, Bob Saget, passed away recently, and while his career was mainly on the small screen, did appear in some movies, and I'm wondering if there's any bit of art that Bob created that you were a fan of. I can't tell if that's a setup or not. Uh, Half-Baked. The cameo in Half Baked, which is a segment that we do in Nothing Personal called So You Want to Talk to Samson. Uh, Bob Saget is probably the most successful comedian who was able to do everything. So he wasn't just raunchy and he wasn't just wholesome. He was both. And it is so hard to be both. And he did it with such a plum. That is why you're seeing this outpouring. In addition to the surprise and how young he was. That always causes causes. Oh, but it's not it's not just the range though, Samson. I mean, Kimmel broke down and said he was taping something fourteen times and couldn't get through it. He wouldn't do, even do it in front of his audience. He kept breaking down, talking about Saget and using the word that everyone's using, which is the sweetest. It's not just that this guy had range or other comedians liked him. Uh, it's that he he absolutely was somebody in this community who was viewed as not one of the ones whose insecurities got the better of him. He was viewed as someone who had grieved loss in his family all his life and made sure that the moments on earth were spent praising others and lifting others and trying to be a spirit that was sweet. Everyone said it of him, which is weird for a raunchy comic. That, that's right. That's the range, though. So when, when people don't know him, the people who you're talking about are people who had a personal relationship with him. The rest of us think we do because we watch him, and they think we do. We think we do because we see him on TV, and we watch his shows and listen to his comedic acts and say, oh, I can relate to that, or oh, that makes me laugh, or oh, I, I imagine what kind of man he was or husband or father. But you're really getting it confirmed to you by those who knew him. So you, you listen to people who had contact with him, and then you confirm your own thought, saying, oh, he was like that. And the outpouring, it, it, it's so magical because of his talent. That's a fan standpoint. From Jimmy Kimmel's standpoint and other people who had a personal relationship with him, it's a totally different thing. They would have had this view of Bob Saget if he weren't the guy from Full House and the raunchiest comedian and the guy from Half Baked. They would have had the same reaction to his sudden death. David, I wanted to circle back on a couple of things just to put a bow on the Flores story. The Harbaugh stuff that's happening in public, can Stephen Ross put his name on I'm not doing this to Michigan and then turn around in two months after doing the minority interviews for the Rooney Rule as a show and hire Harbaugh? Or once he puts his name on that, that's not going to turn around and be a lie in three months, is it? 
words to know because of the way he said it. He got great advice on how to say it. He said, I am not going to take Jim Harbaugh out of the University of Michigan. So what I think happens, and I did this a couple of days ago on Nothing Personal, Jim Harbaugh will have to resign. He will have to say, I want to go to the NFL. And once you know it, a couple of days after that, you saw a little rumor. Those close to Jim Harbaugh are saying that he would like to be in the NFL. It's all happening exactly as you watch Pebbles become an avalanche. He will resign. He will interview places. And then he will take the job with the Dolphins. And, and Stephen Ross will stand up, give money to Michigan to help them get their next coach for some NIL deals and say, hey, I, I said to Harbaugh, please stay at Michigan. You're doing great. <laughs> Don't forget he took a pay cut from $8 million to $4 million last year. And Stephen Ross is going to get him back not just to eight, but above eight to come to the Dolphins. David, in retrospect, armed with all the fallout, I give you to do all of this. How do you do it? Do you do it any differently? Is there a way for you to do it better? Because they're getting crushed on every front, and they have to take it now for as long as it takes Harbaugh to get out of Michigan. And then it'll be then it, then it'll feel better. To, dolphin fans will talk themselves into. Well, they'll be celebrated. Every, then. Well, everyone will I mean, all. For, well, he's saying you ne you have to have these things close together so you don't take the beating in the interim that he's about to take until Harbaugh actually gets out of there, and then they do all the Rooney Rule stuff. If that take takes months, you're going to just take that beating. That's worth it to get Jim Harbaugh. You're going to start seeing some leaks about the candidates right now, and you're going to see some leaks about Harbaugh. And the real question is, Steve Ross, will he move the timeline up and get Harbaugh to leave Michigan sooner than he had planned on in order to start that process? But in, in, in terms of saving ourselves from this bad PR, the only way to do it would to have had a different statement about Brian. I didn't think the statement was it had a typo in it to start with the Miami Dolphins statement. It went through his resume, which is awfully strange. So I thought the way they did it was just surprising. I would have leaked it to a few members of the media to ease the way to the news. It looks as though the Dolphins could be moving on from Brian Flores. They obviously must have a plan. I would have leaked that to the media exactly what the plan was so they could have then gotten it out to the fans so fans wouldn't have had as big an opportunity to question what the hell's going on. Did you care about damage control? Because I didn't feel like you cared about public relations. And so when you give the two options on damage control and you say you could either do this or do that, did you have a disastrous damage control moment? All the time, but of course I cared about it. I, I'm not, I can't even understand your question. Everyone cares about it. You don't want to get hammered. It's not fun. As much as I tell you, and I'll always tell you that I can take it, and the ability to take bad PR and to ignore what people are saying that doesn't mean that you'd rather not have them say it. It means that you can still function with them saying it, but given a choice, of course I'd rather be in a situation where there is nobody upset. What's your review this week? I want to talk about a movie that's not getting any Golden Globes love or Oscar love yet, but it may, with Dev Patel called The Green Knight. I watched it yesterday. And I was absolutely shocked at how much I enjoyed it. It's two hours and 10 minutes of the story of a knight in King Arthur's Round Table. Dev Patel is a knight. He's not a knight. He's got to make a decision about whether or not to stay t true to his word about a deal he made with the devil, in theory. And the movie is shot in a way that is mystical. And you're sitting there watching this performance by Dev Patel shocked and interested in the fact that he's not the actor that you've ever seen in one of these stories about King Arthur and realizing that everything's changed maybe since Hamilton, maybe since before then, where color of an actor doesn't matter, nationality doesn't matter, where maybe now we're to the point where talent matters. In his performance, he's perfect for this role. And I was taken aback because the movie has not gotten the audience reaction that I thought uh, it deserved once I watched it. But I understand why some people would be put off by the complexity of the story, by the, the pace of the story, where you really have to engage with the movie. And some people just don't want to do that anymore. Have, but overall, I thought it was well done. Have you reviewed The Alpinist on Nothing Personal? No, I've not. I've seen it, but I've not reviewed it either Either place. That movie was staggering to me. 
Uh, I don't know. Can we do spoiler alerts? Does well, it work no, that don't way? do it. Don't do it on the Alpinist. Don't do it on the Alpinist. But what I wanted to ask you is, did you think it was better than Free Solo? Because I thought Free Solo was slightly better, but I didn't think I'd see a movie about climbing that would be close to what Free Solo was. And this one was pretty close. It's hard to answer that without doing the spoiler. But Free Solo is a better documentary. They had it was it's the budget for it was bigger than the Alpinist, in my opinion because of the different ways they were able to follow what he was doing in Free Solo. The story of the Alpinist is more interesting to me as an overall story. And the guy from Free Solo appears in The Alpinist. And all I kept thinking when watching The Alpinist is, there, I wanna do so many things and I've done plenty of physical things. In my life, I will never climb a mountain without a rope. Like it wouldn't even occur to me to do that. Well, this, this is the thing. This is the thing about the alpinist. And I, I, maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong. I don't know which one of us is pronouncing it wrong. But if it is alpinist, uh, I, I'm horrified. I've got a hole in my stomach watching some of these it's stuff. It's the alpinist, by the way. <laughs> Neither of you. Huh? Huh? 